There is a fungus that lives in the soil of California and other areas of the Southwest United States. If you inhale the spores, you can get a pneumonia or even worse, the fungus can spread to other parts of your body. She can't be serious right now. I am, and fungus is more common than you might think. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 35-year-old man who came to my office with complaints of back pain and progressive weakness in his legs. He recently moved to the area from New Mexico and really had no significant past medical history, although after I asked him, he said he did endorse a history of valley fever and was prescribed some antifungal medicines that he was told that he should take for the rest of his life. But when he moved, he failed to get that prescription refilled and he decided he was feeling okay, so he was gonna stop taking them. Here's his MRI of his thoracic spine. Now I know many of you do not know how to read thoracic spine MRIs, so here is a comparison of what a normal MRI should look like and his. These things right here are the vertebral bodies of our spine and in between these little rectangles are discs. This gray thing right through here is the spinal cord and the white in front and behind it is the fluid in our spine. So our spinal cord sits in the center of our spine and floats around in a bunch of spinal fluid. And this is not normal. What we are actually looking at is loculations of spinal fluid because the flow of the CSF is obstructed and his spinal cord is right back in here and it's severely compressed. White arrows are pointing to the two regions where we think the CSF is obstructed. He has a very rare diagnosis of spinal coccidiomycosis. Coccidiomycosis is also known as valley fever, and the incidence is 100 to 150,000 cases a year. Here's a map of the United States showing the areas where the fungus can occur. The people and providers that live over here have probably never heard of it or seen it. It's incredibly important to realize that it is a known entity that is fairly common in the Southwest United States, and people can certainly move, like in our patient's instance. Almost 60% of people that are affected with valley fever have no symptoms, and one third of people that have the infection have a self-limiting disease. Acute coccidiomycosis is known as valley fever, and it can be very mild with symptoms improving over one to three weeks without treatment. Symptoms are very similar to flu, with fevers, rash, cough, tiredness, shortness of breath, chills, headaches, night sweats, muscle aches, and muscle soreness. People with weakened immune systems can suffer from chronic coccidiomycosis where those symptoms linger. The most serious form of the disease called disseminated coccidiomycosis is extremely uncommon. It's when the infection spreads outside of the lungs and can go to other parts of our body, including our brain and spine. It can infect the area that coats our spine called the meninges and can lead to a meningitis. It can even cause abscesses in other parts of our brain and spine and this is an example of a discitis osteomyelitis with the vertebral body infected causing spinal compression. The most commonly identified risk factors for disseminated coccidiomycosis include male sex, African-American ethnicity, living in an endemic area, steroid use, and being immunocompromised. Immunocompromised means that your immune system can be weakened. That can be from something like HIV, chemotherapy, or even diabetics. Our patient had a known history of coccidiomycosis meningitis and was told to take chronic antifungal medications, so when he stopped taking them, the infection came back. And I'm proud of you guys because most of you got this answer correct. These are actually pockets of fungal infection that are obstructing the flow of spinal fluid within his spinal canal, causing compression of a spinal cord from a backup of spinal fluid. The CSF flow is kind of like a plumbing system, so if it's plugged up in any spot along the way, the fluid can back up. So to fix it, I'm kind of like a glorified plumber. We just go in there and remove the obstruction. The surgeon goes in and removes those areas where the spinal fluid flow is obstructed, and here is the histological evaluation confirming the diagnosis. Don't get me wrong, this is an extremely challenging case, and the patient may not regain all of the neurological function due to the chronic nature of this infection. It is critically important that the patient stays on their daily suppressive antifungal medication, and in this case, it's fluconazole. In our patient's case, he regained a little bit of function and went on to rehab where he is slowly improving. And of course, taking his suppressive medication. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. I hope you guys learned something in this case. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.